continuing with the final segment of the prerequisites or background from linear algebra, we will look at the topic which has been implicit so far of how we've been looking at a change of basis or even the representation of a basis using matrices. So one of the key things that uh, is worth revisiting is the product of a matrix and the vector. All of us have seen it at some point. So A is our matrix, X and B are our vectors, and that's a simple matrix equation. And the basic idea is that in general, A can be any type of a matrix. It could be a square matrix, a rectangular matrix, a symmetric matrix, an orthogonal matrix, etc. And in the entries in A could be either real or even complex values in general. Of course, we will be looking at particular cases. So in what you would like to do when a solution exists for something of the form A times X equal to B is to be able to find it. In, that's the global goal of a system that's written out like this. For our purposes, since N, the number of elements we will be typically dealing with are finite, we will be looking at matrices in finite dimensions. So a first concept, given that we have already understood in the previous part of this lecture as to what a basis is for a vector space, is to now consider a useful concept that comes up from time to time, the notion of a dual basis. So to understand the notion of a dual basis, we will go back to a very early definition that we would have seen, all of us, I'm sure, the concept of the inverse of a matrix. And in this case, it must be a square matrix. Otherwise, this is not well defined. And the inverse, the one easy way, there are many ways of looking at this. One easy way of defining this is that a matrix types its inverse is the identity, uh, the unit matrix. So we call it the unit matrix. So A times A inverse, whenever that you have a matrix A and you are able to construct A inverse and the product is I, that immediately implies that we have an inverse through the second element of this product, A inverse. Now take A inverse and look at its rows, not the columns, the rows. The rows of matrix A inverse is the dual basis for the same vector space V. And here, V is the vector space for which we started out by constructing A whose columns, as opposed to the rows, were the basis. So that's the concept of a, a dual basis. And just to, you know, you can work this out for yourself, it's straightforward. But if we start out with A being this matrix, which we had seen before as a basis, 3, 1, and minus 2, 1 were the two basis vectors, then A inverse, you calculate using one of several approaches. One is based on the co concept of the determinant of a matrix, and you would get this matrix. And you would like to then verify that, in fact, A, A inverse satisfies this constraint. So that's a simple exercise. I won't walk you through it. It's essentially very elementary matrix calculation. Uh, but I thought that having an example to look at and perhaps work through offline would be useful, a simple one, nevertheless. So continuing with our concept, which is the main thing we are discussing of the product of a matrix with a vector. And if we take vectors x and b as before and matrix a, just wanted to remind you, the product AX, as we worked out through a simple example in the previous segment of this lecture, actually can be viewed or interpreted as a change to the basis. So in other words, the vector stays the same, but it's now being seen in a new basis system. That's the basic idea. So the vector that you now get is the same vector as you had in the old basis, but now it's written out in the new basis. So with this view, what you can also think of, and this is useful for people interested in topics 
such as signal processing is that x is a set of weights, x is a vector, so it is a set of weights and b is the weighted sum of the columns of a. So, if you write out a x, take the first x uh, element of x, x is a uh, vector, so you have x 1, x 2 through x n. Similarly, in order for this to be well defined, a would have n columns. So, take the first column, this is the first column of matrix A and do a scalar multiplication of x 1 with this column, a scalar multiplication of x 2 with the second column and similarly a scalar multiplication of x n with the final column of matrix A. And what you would get then, and then of course you sum the results, you would get a vector B. This is equivalent and a simple algebraic uh, way of rewriting Ax equal to B. So, how do you interpret this if you think about this? So, B, this vector, will lie in the space spanned by these basis vectors at a location determined by x. So, these are the basis vectors a1, a2 through a n, x1, x2 through x n are scale factors that effectively force the value of b. So, that is an interpretation, another way of thinking about a product of a matrix with a vector in the form a x equal to b. And again to recap, what did I just say? I used the word basis. So, a set of linear linearly independent vectors x n form a basis for a vector space V provided this is true, just reminding you x can be written as a sum of a, a, a you know scalar times an element of uh, x. So, basically all I am doing here nothing new is that I am rewriting each element that I want to generate vector x by a linear combination of the basis vectors. And we also now saw that we could just rewrite that also simply as a set of columns of matrix A and we also introduced to summarize the concept of a dual basis. So, so far we should be comfortable in thinking about vector spaces being able to write their bases as column vectors of a matrix A, how one reinterprets a product of a matrix with a vector resulting in a new vector of the form A x equal to B uh, using the interpretation that we saw a minute ago. So, uh, in the, in the, let us take the simple example that we looked at before the column vectors of matrix A in the example we had for two dimensions which is R2, this was our basis B prime and let B double prime be the dual basis of B prime. And therefore, remember that we had to take the inverse and what we did effectively is we, by taking the inverse which I do not show here in detail of course, which can be a simple exercise uh, as I mentioned, you get this matrix B double prime which has columns one fifth two fifth minus one fifth three fifth starting with B prime as these two columns. And now B double prime's rows form the dual basis for B, uh, B prime. So, B double prime is the dual basis for B prime where the rows of B double prime are the basis of the same vector space to summarize as the columns of B prime. So, that pretty much I think concludes what we need to temporarily at least because we will be using these concepts that is what I mean by temporarily uh, 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 concludes the discussion about basis vectors and their algebraic representations. And with that as background, we will just look at a few different types of basis vectors, in particular two types, a type called orthogonal basis and another type called orthonormal basis. These are just terms which have very classical and well-defined meanings. 
So it's useful to remember them basically. Orthogonal bases, two vectors are said to be orthogonal if the dot product is zero. So let us say that these are two vectors and are they orthogonal? Take the two vectors and multiply them out, take the dot product and you would basically get this form 1 times 1 plus root 2 times minus root 2 plus 1 times 1 and if you ex you know expand it out you get 1 minus 2 plus 1 which is 0. So these two vectors are indeed orthogonal. Uh, these a pair of vectors are orthonormal if they are orthogonal and they are also unit vectors. So for example you have 1, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1. It's easy to see the dot product is 0, but they're also unit vectors. So that makes them orthonormal. So orthogonal vectors, which, are, which satisfy the extra constraint that they're unit vectors, become orthonormal vectors. So using these definitions in a straightforward way, a basis, we call that to be orthogonal if its elements, the basis vectors in it, are pairwise orthogonal. And given any two vectors, therefore, from an orthogonal basis, their dot product is zero. And that is another way of saying they're orthogonal vectors. So in addition to that, as I just mentioned through an example, when the vectors of an orthogonal basis are unit vectors, we have an orthonormal basis and the set of vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, easy to see that they form a basis for the three-dimensional Cartesian space R3 and pairwise it's also easy to say their dot products are zero and hence that they are orthogonal. So a few observations about orthonormal basis. And this, it's easy to see, A is our classical example. We've been using it a few times so far. They form an orthonormal basis of R2. And let us use the letter B to represent it. And let A inverse, let's calculate the inverse of this matrix, which because it's this particular form of the vector, unit vector, it, a transpose is also easy to verify is the same as the original vector. And remember in discussing dual bases that the row vectors of A inverse form a dual basis, dual basis to B, and let this be B prime. And let's now look at it. B is this form, column vector 1, 0, column vector 0, 1. This is the same two column vectors, 1, 0, 0, 1, although in this case, it's the rows that form the basis, the dual basis. And what is striking about this and useful to just remind ourselves, they are the same. So it's a general statement, but we certainly note that through this example, the orthonormal basis B is its own dual because B and B prime are identical. So a nice property of orthonormal basis is this fact that duality in the sense that we defined it leads to an identity relationship. By that I mean the two forms are exactly the same. 